You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. You are tuned into the Sonic Society episode number 705. I'm Jack Ward with David Alt. Good morning, everyone. It is the first week of November. Can you smell that chill in the air? Can you believe how we're almost through 2021 already? I, I cannot. <laughs> mm, I know, I know. This week, we are thrilled to return to the amazing people at Faustian Nonsense with Chain of Being, which is a mythic science fiction podcast, which is a glimpse into the future where gods control the cosmos and mortals are left to fend for themselves in a vast, indifferent universe. Follow the immortal Adam of Eden fame as he hunts down an extra universal threat while also confronting his past. Set in an extensive universe that blends religious fantasy elements with space opera science fiction, by Kai Gwilym Pritchard, who I saw at London Podcast Festival way back in September. And he and uh, the other members of the cast actually did uh, a short performance of 10 minutes of this. And I went and listened to everything that I could. So it's it's a good one, everyone. Wow. And <clears throat> for the rest of us, it all begins right here. <laughs> On the Sonic Society. I'm blown away. I wake up to the sound of my alarm. It's five set time, which means it's five for everyone not on a planet or moon. Unfortunately, I can't afford a window room, so I don't get to wake up to the comforting nothing of space. But the live stream on my TV screen is the next best thing. I take two steps and I'm already in the kitchen. I get a can of syrup-flavoured nutrient water and scroll through the news points. Some god did this, an ancient planet appears in orbit around somewhere. New satellite to start construction. Now that catches my eye. It's a small bulletin, but with a tap, I read more about it. An orbit to land transference station was being set up, and as always, they'll be in need of something I was selling. And even if they didn't, I reckon I could get them to buy anyway. In the next few hours, I was already suited up and ready to ship off. My contract request sends through and I step onto the shuttle. Standing. No seats. Nice and cheap. I hang onto the railings as we rattle along and just as we begin to speed up and enter the widening field, something emerges from the sun. We all look on in horror, struck silent by pure terror as the great winged beast, as long as the sun is wide and with a jaw that could swallow a planet, races towards us. It lets out a roar. We we shouldn't be able to hear it, but this creature doesn't adhere to common laws of the universe, and we don't just hear it, but feel it in our bones, in our cartilage. The engine cuts out and we begin to drift. As the beast glides towards us, I hear it say directly to me, not with words, but with thoughts, in an impossible voice that rends my heart in two. And then I am devoured. Narration by David Charles. Uh, Writing and sound design by Kai Gwilym Pritchard. Adam Delta 5, writing and sound design, all by Kai Gwilym Pritchard. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Chain of Being. Email us at chainofbeingofficial at gmail.com for inquiries and stuff. Cover art by Kai Gwilym Pritchard. Thanks for listening. This is Operative One Thane Fatima Hassan checking in from Shuttle 358. 
This is Operative 2, Thane Tubalcane, IAC checking in from Shuttle 358. We read you, Operatives, you're cleared to depart. Visual link is non-operational, so we're going to need you to describe your surroundings. Budget cuts. By Epicurosa, we're Thanes. You don't need to tell me twice. Also, please refrain from invoking any gods. We don't want to draw any unnecessary attention from entities we'd rather not deal with. Departing from shuttle. Now. Initiating free jump. Any visuals for an opening? Well, take your pick. The whole aft side of the hull looks like it's been pulled out from the inside. What does this to a top-of-the-line space station? Leviathan, maybe? Or an angel? We definitely know if there was an angel in the area, and I don't think leviathans leave anything behind. I guess we'll find out. Found a suitable landing zone, adjust by six degrees, and engage thrusters for 2.5 seconds. The following five minutes have been removed for expediency. Landing in three, two... How's it looking, operatives? We're in a large hall. Appears to be half of a shuttle departure lounge. Comfy seats, luggage everywhere, you know the type. We'll look around. Tubalcane, check the structure. See if you can figure out what managed to tear the gorlin apart. There's not even any burns. No witnesses. All signals from the gorlin just suddenly cut out. It's unprecedented. Ayek, focus. Sorry, sir. The structure looks like it's been subjected to immense pressure, but only from one direction, if that makes sense. All the girders are bowed outward, and the hull... Well, I imagine it's out there, presumably with the rest of the debris. It's sort of beautiful, in a way. The way the sunlight glints off the shards of reinforced glass, reflecting it. There's a certain beauty in it. Destruction can be liberating, don't you think? Excuse me? People died, Ayak. Yes, uh, of course, sorry. What's up with you? Fain Hassan, what are your observations? The air is thick with some kind of matter. It looks like skin. It breaks up like ash. I'm taking a sample of it for further study. Come on, where's the nearest terminal? Marking on your display. Fine, let's go. We're in a corridor. There's a T-junction about 16 metres ahead of us with four doorways, two on each side. Damage seems to be relatively minimal. There's a ton of these flakes everywhere and we've got a body. Tubalcane, check around and see what else you can find. There's a Southern Hemisphere Viatorian, male. Their eyes have been removed from the sockets. Pressure change? I don't think so. Under his fingernails. Look. He did this to himself. What the fuck? Yeah, you're right. Scans say he died about 16 hours ago. Command, when did we lose contact with the Gorlan? The halo beacon cut out around 17 hours ago. So there was roughly an hour between whatever caused the damage and that person scratching out their own eyes. What's the room looking like? No more bodies, but it looks like they carved something into the walls. It looks familiar. Describe it to us, Ayak. Ayak. Thane Tubal can respond. Thane Hassan, can you check on him? Yes, sir. Ayak, you can't just stop talking like that. Is this the symbol? Command. It's a vertical line with three curved lines cutting across it horizontally. Nothing's coming up from the symbology database. When was the last time this was updated? About two or three days ago. I'm sure I know this symbol. It's like... It's on the tip of my tongue, but I... Thane Hassan, don't you zone out on me too. Hassan! Yes, sorry. Command, uh... I'm pulling him away. Ayek! Ayek! Can you hear me? He's completely out of it. Get what date you can from the tunnel and get out of there. He's in no position to go anywhere. Come back for him. We need this data. He will be fine. I really don't think that's safe. You said yourself, he's not going anywhere. And do I need to remind you how many cautions you're currently on? But... Fatima. Fine. I'll make my way over. More bodies. Human. 
Tass, Mulgarrick. All wounds seem self-inflicted. More, more runes, same as before. Terminal is slightly damaged, but the data port is fine. This might take a while. What was that? Looks like Tubal Cain is on the move again. That can't be. He was completely out of it when I left him. No way he recovered that quickly. Now, there must be something wrong with my trucker. He's moving too fast. It says he's in a room with you. Can you see him? It's a circular room, so it's not like he's hiding around any corners. Tubal Cain! Telementary says he's right on top of you. <laughs> Fatima, are you there? Fatima, answer me. Operative report. Thane Fatima Hassan was played by Mafrida Hayes. Thane Ayek Tubalcane was played by William Key. Command was played by Glyn Pritchard. Writing and sound design, all by Kai Gwilym Pritchard. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Chain of Being. Email us at chainofbeingofficial at gmail.com for inquiries and stuff. Cover art by Kai Gwilym Pritchard. Thanks for listening. I arrived at the Council Hall of Congregation at 11 o'clock. And in less than 30 minutes, Varys had already convinced me to let him sit in the booth with me to watch the inquiry. I had been sent a brief on what we knew so far about the fate of the Gordon, and thought it couldn't hurt to let them watch. In all my years in pan-galactic politics, I'd never met a more aggressive negotiator than my niece. Well, not niece by blood, obviously, but it didn't hurt to be close to the family of the Vietorian representative. We had joined the council at the same time, so it made sense to pair us up. Every civilization in the council was paired up and their colonies would be slowly merged until they could be considered one. It was all a part of the council's eventual goal to create one universal civilization. <laughs> I doubt I'll see it happen in my lifetime or even Varys's. Humans aren't generally chuffed about suddenly being forced to share with seven foot tall violet humanoids and they made sure I knew it. The disc in my pocket vibrates. Time to go in. Varys! Let's go! The kid looks up excitedly at me, their black and yellow eyes wide with excitement. This is gonna be great! Just don't tell your parents, alright? And don't touch anything. Not even the button that says (laughs) self-destruct. Funny. We step forward into my designated sphere. There's three buttons situated underneath a large screen each one for when it comes to voting. I or nay and abstain. (laughs) Extremely archaic words from a long dead planet but tradition dictates we use them. It's my understanding that some booths have up to five buttons. Some civilizations have concepts beyond the free, yes, no and maybe. I tried talking to a trachadal about them but (laughs) I just ended up getting confused. In the booth with us are my secretary, Philippa Desiva and Johan Kerry, who is the assistant representative. They look quizzically at the Vietorian kid. Come on, I say, looking at the two of them. It's not like we're at war. She's the child of a friend. Philippa shrugs as if to say fair enough, but Johan continues to look at Varys. Not everyone is as accepting of Vietorians being buddies with humans. See, if I could choose an assistant representative like I could choose my secretary, I would have chosen someone else. But unfortunately, Johan was a runner-up in the election. The chamber is a huge cylindrical room, completely covered in spheres embedded in the wall. Each one contains the representative for a civilization. It's a complicated system that puts them there that very few fully understand. At the centre of the room is a podium, on which stands a 3D projector. As the chambers gets quiet, a voice comes from my speakers and human. We will now play the council anthem. I stand up and so does Johan and Philippa. I peer out of the sphere and the other representatives, Meductions, Vietorian, Strachadaud, Dorians, Hass, each one of us here in service of the greater good. As the anthem finishes we all sit down and the visualisation of Ethos appears, this time in the form of silk scarves floating around in a beautiful dance. It speaks, every one of us hearing it in our mother tongue. The Rehoris acknowledge the representatives who have joined us in this congregation of the Council of Nimania. 
The reason for this meeting is the destruction of the CNSS Gorlan and subsequent loss of things Ik Tubal Khan, a Victorian male and Fatima Hassan, a human female. I never met Fatima, but I spoke to her family back on Anwen when I attended her funeral. It was all carried out with such military efficiency, I'm not even sure they got to see her body. Not that that would be a good thing. From the photos on my screen, there wasn't much left of her. As for Ayek, his body is still in the council morgue, despite numerous requests from the Vietorians on Agorakitos to send him home. Logos is sending the necessary information to your screens. From what we gather as something emerged from the dwarf staff Hyoresius and presumably tore apart the Gorlan. The Rephoris find it prudent to tell the council that Kairos was 68% ready for activation. We look at the dancing scarves in shock and Johan swears under his breath. Kairos was a lesser known part of the Rhetories. It was responsible for when time was of the essence. The council would be suspended and the galaxy would enter a state of emergency. 68% was extraordinarily high. Ethos disappears and in its place, an eternally constructing spiral appears. Logos speaks. The energy signature of Tiresias changed significantly at 6.43 set time. At that point all telemetry cut out. We do know that something left a large amount of organic matter in its wake. A trail of an ashy substance can be found leading from Tiresias, past the Gorlin and onward out of the solar system. The organic matter trails off, but on your screens you will be able to see the predicted course. The Rehtoris recommend military action all along this path and the implementation of an immortal operative. At this I turn to Philippa. I can really tell what she's about to say. The kid shouldn't be here for this. Joan chimes in. Agreed. I press the door release and shoo them out before they can say anything. I quickly transfer them a few units to buy themselves some food and mouth. Go! Before closing the door again. Sorry guys, my bad. I didn't realise this congregation would be so... grave. I turn back to the hall and a debate is ensuing about what operative would be assigned to the case. From the 3D project to their profiles of the different ancient beings in service to the council, they have been indentured to us as punishments from the gods. Each one having done something, we don't get told that sort of thing. The representatives Korksky is speaking. My sphere translating a series of clicks and taps into something I can understand. And so, in short, Artemis cannot be assigned to this investigation as she is doing important work on Halvatha. And to remove her would undo everything that she and the Vint there have worked to achieve. Fair enough, I think, and press the option to remove Artemis from the listing. For the next few hours, we methodically go through each ancient being in our service. Delia of Corinth. Busy in the depths of the temple of Nemesis of Rigel X. Neutronus, clearing a space station of demonic infestation. One by one, the list gets shorter and shorter, and I watch the name at the bottom of the list get closer and closer to the top. And with creeping dread, I begin to realise that we might actually have to use him. I can tell that everyone else in the chamber feel the same way, and they begin to shuffle nervously. After the penultimate operative is removed from the list, his profile takes the centre of the room. Before anyone gets the chance to speak, the vote is almost unanimously a no. I tap my screen a few times to contest the result. Only one of five I get in a year. Ephos announces me. The hall recognises representative of the humans Alexander Ashton. I fully empathise with the council. We all have our grievances with him. The humans more than anyone, but time is of the essence. We cannot afford to wait around to do nothing while whatever this thing is wreaks havoc in all galaxies. Say what you will about him, but he always completes his task. But at what cost? The Hass representative Morvi of the Deep speaks. On the colony of Vestia, he was set to free the copper shadow from its torment, and he ended up destroying the whole artifact along with it. On a mission to retrieve a new weapon schematic, he just didn't return. There's a reason he's nowhere near having done his time in working for us. I take a deep breath. And I see that. I see all of you, but no one else is available I and mean, if we wait any longer, the trail of this thing will go cold. Kairos was at 68% and if the Rhetories recommend the use of an ancient one, then I for one intend to take their advice. I implore you to think not about your petty squabbles 
but it's about the greater good for all of our sakes. I sit down and watch the charts on my graph fill in with the new votes. Every single representative in the hall selected abstain or some equivalent. And as the yellow bar rises and rises, I get the message. If we absolutely have to use him, it's going to be you who bears the responsibility. As the final vote comes in, I press I and Aoife speaks. The motion carries. The council moves to assign Adam Delta Phi to the task of investigating the new disturbance. He shall be notified. The congregation disbands for the day and we begin to file out. Send the sphere at onto Philippa. He's gonna be our problem, isn't he? She nods sympathetically. I'm gonna need some painkillers and the whiskey. Alexander Ashton is played by Jonathan Arroy. Veris is played by Teresa Scheiben. Johan Kelly is played by Nathan James. Marvel of the Deep and Karksy played by Glyn Pritchard. Dorian representative played by Anna Mae Wood. Adam Delta 5, writing and sound design, all by Kai Gwilym Pritchard. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Chain of Being. Email us at chainofbeingofficial at gmail.com for inquiries and stuff. Cover art by Kai Gwilym Pritchard. Thanks for listening. Hello, yes. Uh, this is Representative Alexander Ashton, here to inquire about Adam Delta 5. I've brought my assistant with me, I hope that's okay. Yeah, of course, come in. So, what was it you were here for? We sent an officer to you a while back to close a portal that had uh, opened up. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 we, uh, we sent him to... Ah, Horus Minor. One of our moons. Excellent. Is he here? Uh, no, I don't believe he is. Do you mind if we wait for him? Be my guest. When did you last see him? We're in a bit of a hurry. Oh, uh, about three years ago. What? Where is he? Stone Forest, I believe. Why didn't you go pick him up? We thought the council would be responsible for that. Has he sent you any messages? Ha! <laughs> from Forest? <laughs> Good luck getting a radio signal from that. Backwater shithole. All right, just landed. Try and get this work done ASAP. There's some scavengers over on that ridge there giving my ship a once over. We'll try and keep it brief, but please don't leave us here. Yeah, all right, whatever. Uh, he wasn't lying about backwater, was he? Looks like it's been through a war. It has. There's been a civil war raging for a good five years. How have we not heard about this? I guess there have always been more pressing issues. We'll have to do something about this. Let's find Adam. Where should we look? Um, the bar? Sure, though I have a feeling it won't be easy finding him. Something tells me that he's the kind of person that doesn't like to be... There he is, in the cafe. Oh. Adam Delta 5, we've been looking for you. Well, you took your fucking time. I'm representing. We've met, Alexander. Surprised you haven't been voted out yet. We're here on behalf of the council of... Yeah, I know. You don't look like you're from around here. Well, you stand out a bit yourself. So you guys are here to take me back then? Your help is needed urgently. By who? The council? The council fucking forgot me. I thought the oh-so-benevolent council would at least help the people here, but you know where to be seen. It surely can't be that bad. We would have heard. We would have come to help. Oh yeah? On this scrap heap of a planet, all I've eaten is energy paste. I don't see how... Because that's the only food the bandits don't want to steal. This whole place is a mess. In this subculture of Viatorians, if a family member dies before their time, the rest of the family get a red line tattooed on their faces. Take a look around. There's not a single person without a red line. Some of them have them over their lips, others over their eyes. Some vertically, some horizontally. I, I guess placement depends on the family. But there's one woman. She works at the mine. Her face and neck are almost entirely covered, decorated in a symmetrical pattern of swirls and dots. It's mesmerizing. It's also painfully tragic. So when you tell me the council need my help, forgive me if I take a moment to appreciate the irony. We will send aid. I will personally see to it that something is done, but what we need you for is more urgent. What is it? 
Eight days ago, something came out of the Red Dwarf Tiresias. It destroyed the CNSS Gordon and left a large amount of organic matter behind. Upon investigation by two things, it was found that the inhabitants of the Gorlin had killed themselves by carving out their own eyes. All data was corrupted beyond recovery and this symbol was found repeatedly all over the station. And upon looking at said symbol, then I-8 Tubalcon underwent some kind of transformation. Something akin to demonic possession, but way more extreme. We're ruling out Infernal Influence for now. Let's see it. Here. I've seen that before. Everyone gets that. It's an extreme sense of deja vu. It's right there, but no one can place it. No, as in, I know it. I remember. It was there in Eden. I'm sure of it. Then you know what it is? It's been a while since I was there, Alexander. Excellent. We've kind of sort of got a lead. Why are you choosing me for this? Given your particular skills and experience. I was the last one on the list, wasn't I? Uh, yeah. We will come back, I swear. I'll, I'll do something. Don't make promises you don't intend to keep. Something bigger and more universe-threatening will come along. And besides, they're not your responsibility. So no, you won't come back. Alexander Ashton is played by Jonathan Arloy. Administrator Balsu, played by Glyn Pritchard. Pilot, played by Anna Mae Wood. Philippa Desiva, played by Millie Davenport. Adam Delta 5, writing and sound design, all by Kai Gwilin Pritchard. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Chain of Being. Email us at chainofbeingofficial at gmail.com for inquiries and stuff. Cover art by Kai Gwilin Pritchard. Thanks for listening. As the swamp moves around her, the mystic sits completatively within the ribcage of a large, long dead, long dead beast. Her house, or rather her living space, is strung between two of the ribs, made up of animal skins and sheet metal from fallen starships. It is no different from any of the other homes of shamans, oracles or soothsayers that had decided this was the place that they would think for the rest of their lives. She is no different, at least not in her intentions. She too has resigned herself to rest and ponder until she had rusted away and the lights in her eyes had faded out. She is very much unlike the others in this town in two ways, however. The first being that she was the only Malgaric she had so far seen, with her silver metal skin, luminous lines that travel up and down her body, great glowing eyes and several ornaments that hover around her head in complete stillness. She made quite a sight, especially when night fell and the blue glow that she emanated kept some of the other hermits from their rest. The other way that she was so vastly different to her peers was that she was truly a mystic. Undoubtedly, the others had found some philosophy that might be the answer to universal peace or had made strides in discovering new forms of magic that would die with them. But only she truly understood the origins of the universe, its biggest threats and exactly what it was that had emerged from a red dwarf over 400 light years away. There was much she couldn't comprehend. Not due to a lack of life experience, that was for sure, but simply due to the ineffable nature of the things she felt. She knew these things, but simply couldn't comprehend them. She likened it to trying to communicate the specific dangers of radiation poisoning to a bird. It understands danger, but cannot comprehend cells or waves or energy. Or perhaps not, for a bird does not have all the knowledge and cannot learn whereas she had the information in her head somewhere. She simply couldn't pass it. She hadn't spoken to anyone in such a long time she wasn't sure if she could convey her ideas effectively anymore. Not like she used to do. That's the floor with hermits, she thinks to herself as a large, winged reptile flies peacefully overhead. It's all well and good disappearing into the wilderness to discover profound truths about the universe, but if you don't go back and properly explain them, you're no good to anyone. Each one of us like a library on fire. 
She knows she will have an important vision tonight. She can tell. She'd more or less had them every night since her youth. Sometimes her fatigue would get the better of her and she'd wave them off or simply forego sleep due to a long night of studying or other activities. She laughs to herself, quiet and sharp. Visions were rare and hard to come by for most people. The others who lived in the ribs would die to have just a glimpse of a noetic vision like her. The very idea of simply waving one off just because they were tired would have been alien to them. Best be foraging round about now, she says to no one. Vartesh, can I get you anything? She calls to the old human. They look at her but say nothing nor does their solemn expression change. She knew they wouldn't say anything, but she enjoyed the little ritual all the same. Fair enough, she shrugs, and wraps her shawl tightly around her. As she stoops down to pick up a rolder root from a puddle, she begins to consider origins. It was a topic that dominated many of her thoughts in the past few decades. She knew the names of all the prime beings, Adam, Eve, Anamir, Tyre. She knew which gods were the progenitors of which species. Epicurosa and Deus Twelve for the humans. Just Epicurosa for the Viatorians and of course Holden Heart of her own people. She wasn't aware of her origin. No Malgaric were. She, like everyone else, had been dropped from the mother factories. Great, hulking machines that spat out Malgaric and took in... Well... No one was quite sure what made them tick, so to speak, or even what was inside. It was one of the great mysteries of her people. A piotl fish skitters by and she reaches out to grab it, before she can explode in a flash of brilliant yellow light. Too slow. It must be older than I thought, she says to the smouldering carcass of the fish. She'll probably head home now anyway. On her journey back, as the suns begin to set on the long, flat horizon, she notices another crashed ship. It looks terribly new. Already, scavengers from the local junker town are stripping it down. They eye her with caution, but as soon as they realise that she is no threat, they get back to business, pulling out wiring and tearing off the chassis. As she settles down in her shack, stew in hand. She feels the vision begin to tug lightly at the edges of her consciousness. With a contented sigh, she puts the bowl down and slips away. The cold anger and confusion of the loss. A large pale hand picks her up and shows her someone, glass all. Two lines down either dark eye, extreme significance in what has come and what will come to be. The desire to change the world, or rather to return to what is recognisable. Light refracting from a prison. A wide smile, incomprehensible even to those who comprehend all. Loss and regret, fear and a deep and hopeful sorrow the cold and indifferent face of a god, turning to anger and then panic. The Mystic was played by Francis Gillard. Writing and sound design, all by Kai Gwillen Pritchard. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Chain of Being. Email us at chainofbeingofficial at gmail.com for inquiries and stuff cover art by kai gwillen pritchard thanks for listening a soft gurgling can be heard in the pipes buried within the bowels of the aen avian arc surrounded by a thousand other pipes with a thousand other jobs this gurgling would go unnoticed by a crew of humans which is why the Alliance of Earth Nations felt it necessary to design and construct one of the largest self-sustaining systems of AI-controlled maintenance drones ever conceived of. It's not long before a circular drone scatters along and begins to scan the pipe for blockages. All of a sudden, the whole station falls silent 
as a large and indescribable presence drifts by. The complexity of this presence supersedes all code written into this drone, and it stops. Proximity alone to this thing that occupied every aspect of existence, even beyond those of physical and logical realms, this oppressive force beyond forces causes the entities within the avian arc to shift internally, even down to the code that drives them. This indescribable, incomprehensible pressure emanates something which moves the station to behave in a way so vastly different to how the multitude of coders and engineers intended for it to behave. One might be driven to call it possession. I'm sat in a carrier. It's hurtling through space at speeds which cause the ship to shake and rumble lightly with total surety. Back in the old days, speeds like this were impossible to achieve. But since the discovery of the widening field, travelling across the universe became easy as... Well, still extremely expensive and difficult to achieve, but it's possible now. Sat across from me is an old Victorian man, strapped into the economy class seats, surrounded by luggage. His skin has faded into a light blue with age, and he stares at me with the look of a man who is not expecting to see or experience anything new until death but has been rudely ripped from his resignation into the haze of old age. Hello. Nice to meet you. My name is Adam. As in, capital A, Adam. I say to him, masking my discomfort with friendliness in the hopes that he'll at least give me attention in a nicer way. Isn't every Adam a capital A, Adam? He replies, maintaining his demeanour. Well, um, I start. I can tell who you are. The glass horns give it away. I reach up and touch the glass protrusions coming from my forehead. At least he didn't zero in on any of my other features that differentiate me from regular humans. The two of us are the last passengers on this 400-seat, 50-year-old, well-worn and slightly dingy carrier. I stand up and move to the cockpit in order to avoid the old man's gaze. The two pilots are making their final preparations to land and drop me off. The ship jolts as it docks with the orbital station, the ship's onboard AI doing most of the work. The doors on the side of the ship open, and I exit. The hangar for the avian arc looks like shit. Space stations are usually built to deal with a minor problem, if they're designed well enough and nothing interferes with them. I'd heard stories of demons materialising inside space stations, fusing with them in the orbit of planets, at which point the punished, such as myself, have to get involved. It sounds strange, but I'm hoping it is that. Seeing that symbol shook me. Something about being reminded of Eden has given me this pit in my stomach I can't seem to shake. In terms of cold, hard facts, all I know is that the avian arc sat along the predicted course of whatever it was that destroyed the Gorlan, and that every warning was set off at once. The data received was completely unreadable and seemed... panicked. At least to me. When I said that to the investigators, they looked at me like I'd insulted them personally. But being alive for as long as I have teaches you a lot of things. Chief among them being that science and logic can only take you so far. Regardless, it seemed like the two were related. The avian ark was designed to house all manner of species of birds, one of many other preservation centres. It was meant to preserve and propagate in the face of the loss of Earth. There's no engineering department on stations like this. The whole station is fully automated, making it somewhat vulnerable to attack and looting. The station does have some defence capabilities, but it's mostly reliant on outside human security that is stationed on the nearby planet. Currently, the blast doors of the hangar are shut. They very rarely get opened unless it's to accommodate large craft delivering supplies or ships that don't have normal docking capabilities. The hangar is barren, save for a few empty boxes. The unusual thing is that it seems like it's been dismantled. The lights in the ceiling are mostly off. There are great swathes of exposed wiring hanging loose from the walls and ceilings. The surfaces are built up with grease and dust, and the whole room just seethes with dilapidation. They see three decontamination chambers at the end of the room. Two of them are still lit up, but the last one is dark. But as I walk closer, carefully avoiding missing floor panels and debris, I see that the interior has been completely and meticulously stripped clean. The panelling, wires and tubing that spray the visitor with antibacterial solution are completely missing. Essentially, all that was left was just a hole in the wall. 
Not being one to let anything get in the way of proper procedure, I decide to use the working chamber. As I enter, I hear a depressing spurt and a few drops of cleaning fluid trickle out of the sprinkler overhead and onto my horns. I step over the gap where the seal used to be, and I'm in a long corridor. It's curved slightly around the main column of the avian arc. This particular station is a large core surrounded by three rings. At the centre column are the habitats, dozens of artificial biomes designed to replicate Earth's atmosphere as close as possible to the real thing. It's not though. No amount of machinery could replicate that. At either end of the corridor there's two staircases, one going up and one going down. There's a terminal in front of me with a touchscreen. I press the activation button. Nothing comes on. I press the button above labelled help. A red light flickers on and a voice comes seemingly out of nowhere. Hi, I'm Pargo, the protector and guide of the avian arc. How can I help you today? An AI, thank the stars. That makes things far easier. Paga, can I port you to my Visulink? Absolutely. I'm a state of the art AI. Not anymore. I didn't catch that, sorry. Nothing. What's happened to the avian arc? I'm afraid that information cannot be accessed at a public terminal. Okay, how do I get access to that information? You'd have to converse directly with the overseer. Would you like me to schedule a meeting? It usually takes three to five days for them to get here. I'm in a bit of a hurry. On which floor is the overseer's office located? Allow me to escort you. Please follow the markers on your Visulink. I begin making my way up the stairs. The curve around the central column is very slight, almost unnoticeable. The notice boards on the walls flicker on and off, some missing the internal circuitry entirely. Can you tell me why the avian arc is missing so many components? Station protocol states that under certain circumstances, resources can be reappropriated for the use in repair and upgrade of the maintenance drones. Which circumstances were met? I'm afraid that's restricted information. As I'm following the path highlighted on my Visulink, I see to my right where there is usually a set of double doors, only one remains. Out of curiosity, I shuffle past and step through. The room is large. It's more of a hall than anything. The pressure feels almost immediately different that, along with the humidity and heat, knocks the breath out of my lungs. The whole space is done out like a savannah. Large acacias, tall grass waving gently in the artificial wind. At the sides of the room, where there should be a wide, sweeping, unbroken facsimile of the sky, there are large chunks absent, ruining the illusion. This is a restricted area. Please leave immediately or I will be forced to call security. What? Am I going to be waiting a week to get arrested? No. Security is on board currently. Automated security was banned long before this station was constructed. Due to certain circumstances. Certain circumstances, blah blah. But if there's no onboard defence, and the security team aren't here, then you must mean self-constructed security, right? Please leave the area. I don't want to wait and find out what sort of machine a station creates to protect itself after being shocked into emergency shutdown, so I make my way out. But before I reach the door, a thought strikes me. Where have all the birds gone? The whole room is silent. There are a few insects buzzing lazily through the air, as well as the rustle of leaves and flowing of water. Station protocol states that under certain circumstances, resources can be reappropriated for the use in repair and upgrade of the maintenance drones. You've already said that, but what does that mean? What does that have to do with the birds? Please leave the aerial. I pace out of the room. As I leave the artificial savannah and step back into the staircase, I spot a maintenance drone. It's a wide, flat thing designed to be as unnoticeable as possible without being a tripping hazard. A series of arms suddenly pop out from underneath the metal carapace and begin to dismantle something within the walls. It removes the panelling and I see it pull components and wires out. It doesn't move or act like any sort of typical automated drone would. It's sloppy and almost seems organic. The fervour with which it pulls the walls apart almost seems... angry. Let's take a look at you. As I reach out to pick it up, it turns and hisses at me, and the appendage pops out from underneath. What I thought was mechanical seems more like bone, muscle and sinew. I pull my hand back and it scurries away. Weird. I follow the drone along the course set for me by Paga, picking up my pace slightly to keep up. Suddenly, it veers off to the left, down a long corridor that leads to the first of the three rings. I see that the path on my visual link is bringing me up further along the edge of the main column. Thanks for the help, Pagga, but I'm going to take a little look around on my own. Please stick to the set path. Ignoring Pagga's request, I follow the trail of the drone. I can see it in the distance as it races to the entrance of the ring. On either side of me are long, uninterrupted windows which give a glimpse into the vastness of space. I can just about make out the other corridors that connect the detached first ring to the rest of the station. 
Please turn back. You're about to enter a restricted area. Don't worry about me. I'm just going to have a look. Please state your business on the avian arc. Restricted information, unfortunately. I'm sure you understand. Security doors on either end of the corridor suddenly close, and I'm left trapped. Pago, what's going on? I hear the clunking of machinery and the panel above me detach. With deadly immediacy, I feel my body pulled out into the cold and unforgiving vastness of space. Narration by David M. Sledge. Old Man, played by David Charles. Paga, played by Nathan James. Adam Delta 5, writing and sound design, all by Kai Gwillen Pritchard. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Chain of Being. Email us at chainofbeingofficial at gmail.com for inquiries and stuff. Cover art by Kai Gwillen Pritchard. Thanks for listening. There's an oppressive weightlessness that engulfs your body when you hang in the empty and infinite vastness of space. You suddenly feel very unrestricted, by gravity, by air resistance, and for a split of a split second, you feel this intense sense of freedom. And then when you try and breathe in and your lungs start to collapse, in another split second, you take stock of your situation and panic sets in. This not being a new experience of exposure to space, the panic is dampened slightly, but the immediacy that my actions have to carry is still in the forefront of my mind. I watch the corridor I was just standing in get further and further away from me. I start to feel an intense burning in my fingers. The cold is starting to destroy the cells in my hands, and I clench my teeth to deal with the pain. I have about 15 seconds before I lose consciousness and float off, lost forever. 15. I fumble through the pockets in my bandolier. 14. I pause and take a look back at the corridor. The panels have closed and behind the thick glass I could just about make out something moving, staring back at me. 13. I turn back to my bandolier and pull out a small length of golden yarn with a black needle tied to the end. It gleams faintly in the darkness of space and flows gently as if underwater. 13. I bite down hard on the thread and it begins to shine brightly, almost blindingly so. Slowly it begins to extend, curling and tangling in the vacuum. It surrounds and illuminates me in the unforgiving nothingness. 12. I reach out and grab the needle and hold it between my index finger and thumb. 11. At the top of the station there's an emergency exterior airlock. 10. I draw back my hand and throw the needle like a dart, aiming squarely at the airlock. 9. It whizzes through the vacuum and lands right on the door, piercing the metal. 8. The throw sends me in the opposite direction, and so I begin to reel myself in. 7. I start tugging hard on the yarn to propel myself forward. 6. I'm about halfway, and my head is throbbing with an intense pain. 5. With a final yank, I float to the airlock and pull the emergency release. 4. The door finally opens, and I drag myself in. 3. It closes behind me. 2. The room pressurises and floods with oxygen, and I pull great heaps of air into my lungs, like a glutton at a banquet. I breathe in so much it hurts, and for a few seconds, I'm on my hands and knees, just breathing. Through a small viewport in the window, I watch the golden yarn start to shudder against the confines of itself, and then it dissipates, lost forever. I open the door and find myself on the top floor of the station. A very much operational notice board tells me as such. All there is on this level is a single glass door with a plaque labelled Overseer's Office Server Room. I try to open it. It's locked. I look around the space and see a row of chairs arranged in what seems to be a makeshift waiting room. The chair smashes the glass with relative ease and I step through. The room is full of rows and rows of servers, all lined up in the darkness like glowing tombstones, filling the kilometre-wide room, stretching high up to the ceiling. The room is cold and I can hear a soft hum of air conditioning. At the centre of the room, I see a terminal sat on a small desk. As I march down the narrow aisle of humming machines, I can't get rid of the feeling that something is watching me. I can feel its cold gaze on my back, and I stop suddenly and look behind me. Nothing. At the desk, I sit myself down in a chair. The terminal is as old as can be expected in the ship built this long ago, but I turn it on and begin working on getting it open. Within a few minutes, I have it working, and I go straight for the mainframe interface. Query. 
System down. Appropriated resources. System alert. The results fill my screen. At 3.16 a.m. set time, the whole station paused and then shut down. After the automatic restart, it would seem something had worked its way into the system. I'm sat in a kilometre-long room filled with servers, staring at it. This thing. And it makes no sense. It should not work within the mainframe of the avian arc, and yet somehow it had inserted itself and caused incredibly drastic effects. I see the same kind of insertion in several other parts of the code, and slowly it begins to dawn on me. I line up each separate insertion, and I finally see it. The same symbol drawn all over the Gorlan. The same symbol from Eden all those years ago. A vertical line with three curved lines cutting across it. Drawn in foreign code. Whatever emerged from the Tiresias had been here, and its mere presence had caused this. Perhaps by some conscious effort, or maybe simply by way of emanating its will. That pit in my stomach feels like a weight now. The fear travels in my chest and down into my abdomen, and for a short moment I pause. My hands just hovering above the keyboard. Fuck. The best course of action now is to shut it all down and hail the council. I type in a command to shut down the mainframe and press enter. I speak into my visual link. This is Adam Delta 5. I've remedied the situation. Please send someone to come get me this time. I'll explain when you get here. I, I just want to get the fuck out of here. I lean forward. Elbows on knees, clenching tight fistfuls of my hair, staring at the ground. Fuck. A noise comes from the entrance to the room. I look up. I can just make out a dark silhouette of something blocking out the light coming from the waiting room. For a moment we just watch each other, and I feel its cold gaze. And then it begins to run. I leap over the desk and enter the forest of servers, hoping to make a beeline for the exit. I forget all the anxiety about whatever it is that could bend a computer to its will just from being close, and I forget all my regret and my shame, and I just start running. Left. Right. Right. Left. I try to make my movements as erratic as possible, hoping to evade my pursuer. I make a sharp left, pushing against one of the monoliths, cross over the path, and go into the other bank of machines. One question goes through my mind, inescapable amongst the rows and rows of inoperative machines. If this thing is what I think it is, how is it still active? I see a glint of white metal and I stop, back flat against the server. It has to be one of the security drones. It makes a soft gurgling sound and I hold myself in complete stillness. The drone leans forward and then sprints off, deeper into the maze. Once it's out of earshot, I start to run and leap out of the door down the stairs, three to four steps at a time, ignoring the sting in my feet as I land. I reach the entrance to the top ring and pause, once more taking a deep breath. I really need a gun. Still heaving, and with my hands on my knees, I look down the corridor. What's down there? Some kind of instinct tells me that the answers I'm looking for are in the top ring. I draw myself up, and once more, start running. Please don't eject me. Please don't eject me. Please don't eject me. The doors ahead of me begin to close, and I jump, to avoid tripping and banging my head. The doors to the entrance just in front of me suddenly open. Something's wrong. I burst through and stop myself just in time. What must have been the first floor is now just a... ledge, above what is the partially hollowed out remnants of the first ring. Each wall and floor of every room meticulously taken apart, and the sides of the space are what remains of the rest of the ring. What horrifies me most in all this are the swarms of drones in the space. Some, like the round drone, are together in massive hordes, smothering some great mass that writhes and twitches. At the centre of the chaos there's some kind of horrific assembly line. The carcasses of birds torn apart for parts, drones with muscle and sinew fused to their circuitry components in some horrific process. Those with reappropriated organs and parts move on, presumably to devour more parts of the station. Some abomination flies through the air, sailing like kites on stolen wings. I take a step back. Something makes a noise behind me, and before I'm able to turn around, I feel a searing pain in my torso. I look down and see a long appendage protruding outwards from my chest, composed of metal fused to bone, wrapped in muscle and flesh, stray feathers soaked in the blood of us both. It leans in, gurgles, and I lose consciousness. up with a council medic above me, the all-too-familiar sting of nanobots deep in my chest. 
I look up at them. Why do you all wear visors? Impartiality. You shouldn't have survived this. Well, I am immortal. You don't deserve it. He says, and then walks off. Later that day, I read the mission debrief. The avian ark was lost. After a team of thanes dragged me out, the council obliterated it to prevent the spread of the insertion and to destroy the abominations. In their eyes, losing the last samples of the griffin vulture, the west jackdaw, the Congo peafowl, and many others was worth the safety of the galaxy at large. I place the tablet on the bedside table and rest my head on the pillow, my horns knocking against the plastic headboard. I clench my eyes and run my hands through my hair, grabbing tight fistfuls of it. Fuck. Medic played by Eric Smith. Adam Delta 5, writing and sound design, all by Kai Gwillen Pritchard. Follow the podcast on Twitter at Chain of Being. Email us at chainofbeingofficial at gmail.com for inquiries and stuff. Cover art by Kai Gwillen Pritchard. Thanks for listening. And that's this week's show. Please check out Chain of Being and all of the other amazing shows at Faustian Nonsense through our show notes at sonicsociety.org, which is, of course, as I said last week, a proud founding partner of the Mutual Audio Network. You can join us on Twitter at Sonic Society or at David Alt, on Facebook at Audio Drama Radio Drama Lovers or the Sonic Society Group, or wherever amazing audio drama can be found. I'm David Alt, and this is Jack Ward. Hi there. <laughs> Please join us next Sunday from because I wasn't going to let let him give me all of this paragraph at the end of the script. <laughs> Please join. I figured us. I did enough for both of us last week. So <laughs> <laughs> does, yes. Please join us next Sunday for more amazing audio drama and have a wonderful day. Take care, folks. Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Hello and welcome. You are turned into the... S- turned. Ah. <laughs> are you in the mood for a good laugh? <laughs> or maybe a good scream? How about some childlike wonder? Or a thought-provoking mystery? Then get your ears ready for a treat, because the Mutual Audio Drama Network presents shows every day for your enjoyment. Each day is a different genre featuring the talents of a huge pool of audio drama masters. Oh, and some clever comedy creators as well. (laughs) Subscribe to the Mutual feed and get them all, or choose the genres you really love. You'll find the Mutual Audio Network at all your favorite places, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, EarBuddies, Podcast-O-Rama, Casting Call, Cod past and wherever quality shows are found. Okay, I made a few of those up. Or simply go online to MutualAudioNetwork.com. And of course, it's all free. Free. The Mutual Audio Drama Network. Listen and imagine together. Maintaining social distancing, of course.